Welcome to this special broadcast of CNBC Africa's debate from the EU Africa Business Forum. I'm Esther Awuni. A delegate gathered in Brussels for one of the European Union's biggest annual summits on development cooperation. At the summit, founding editor of Forbes Africa, Chris Bishop, hosted a debate where panelists discussed the European Commission's external investment plan. Take a look. Just to start off with, if I can go from uh, left to right here, just a, a brief uh, mention, if you could, just your reaction of what the European Union is trying to achieve here with investment in Africa. What's your initial reaction to it, sir? Well, that's a very important uh, subject for Europe and for the world. I think, uh, again, Africa is going to go, to go from 1 billion inhabitants to 2 billion in uh, 30 years. So we have to help our African friends and partners to develop and especially to create jobs. I think the most important thing is to create uh, jobs locally. So uh, this is very interesting and very good that uh, Europe can uh, build, rebuild uh, a priority, a project, uh, uh, which would be, you know, a 30 years project. But we absolutely need, uh, they have to integrate the business people that we represent, because without the business people, nothing will happen. Because we are in the actions, we are in concrete actions, and this is a basic, uh, if you look at the past, we have been talking, talking, talking. Now we need actions, actions, and actions. Rebecca, what's your view? Europe and Africa are independent, and I think it's crucial. It's the only way forward, especially with the way the world is changing at the moment. I think it's in both continents' interest to work very closely together. It's the only way forward. Imal, on the inside, looking out, what's your view of this investment uh, initiative? I think it's uh, fantastic. Every investment initiative is very well welcome. I think um, Africa needs a lot more investment. Um, if you look at demand, the demand side is being created out there just by the demographics. Uh, when you look at, when you talk about Pierre, uh, 1 billion people are going to become 2 billion, 2.4 billion. I think the demand is going to be there. So food, clothing, shelter, name it, logistics, the whole lot. Um, the landmass, if you look at the landmass, it's quite big anyway. And uh, when we talk about a billion people there uh, becoming 2 billion, it's going to be bigger than India, China or anywhere else. And that's why the demand side is getting stronger. The key issue is the supply side. And that's why I'm saying we've got to create the supply side, the supply side for everything, which is where the opportunity lies. And I think that's the opportunity that either the EU or anybody else looking at it and saying we can help. However, I think smart partnerships, strong partnerships need to be created out there. And I think a lot of leadership out there is actually looking for this. So this is probably the right time when things are really moving. People want to move it. Leaders want to do it. However, we have a big problem in Africa, and that is capital formation. Capital formation is a big um, missing action sort of thing. And I think that's where it's available out here. So you've got the supply side, you've got the know-how, we've got the demand side. So I think this is where we need to sort of bring it together and say, fine, there is a match here. OK. Uh, Mr. Gattaz, if I could just ask you one question on home territory. I mean, you've just had a change of administration in France, a new president. What do you think France's uh, outlook towards Africa is likely to be with the new administration? Uh, France has a long history with Africa, and I think we uh, should come back to a new world now, to see the future, not the past. Uh, we should forget the past, I would say, and see the next 30 years again. That means seeing the future with our African partners without arrogance, first of all. It's a win-win. We have to build a win-win partnership. That means we have to sell, to uh, technologies, to uh, put local jobs, of course. But we have to learn from uh, the African entrepreneur. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs from Africa. They are excellent. They are very good. The young entrepreneurs are excellent in digital. For instance, in Kenya, you got applications on mobiles for payments, which are very simple, but very outstanding, extraordinary technologies. So I think we have to build these win-win partnerships in the next 30 years saying we are going to get from you and we are going and you are going to get from us but that's going to be balanced and i'm sure that if we go into that direction without saying i know everything i'm going to learn you to teach you and you're going to buy my products this is it this is not good mm. if you say together we are going to, to build a new world uh, and the, the new relationship between europe and africa because you, we need growth you need, you need growth we need jobs but you need jobs 
And again, together, we can build a good future. And I think France has maybe a role to play, because as you know, 40% of the Africans speak French. We have a long story. So we could be, we, we could be a kind of open gate uh, from Europe to Africa, not the only one, of course. Again, no arrogance, but just because we have all history and all relationships that we can use to, to rebuild the future. Rebecca, I mean, Mr. Katas mentioned not five minutes ago, thing is time is the time for action. What difference do you think this uh, investment initiative could make to the lives of the entrepreneurs that you, you deal with in the African continent? A, a huge difference. I think if, if it's recognized, and I think now it has slowly over the last few years, it's been recognized the relevance of, 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 of the formation of new businesses, especially SMEs and new um, entrepreneurs create SMEs and then strengthen the community. So I think it's, it's huge. What is relevant, though, is how fast it takes. Often these kind of investment um, programs are very, can be very bureaucratic, can take a long time. By that time, all creativity is lost and the idea is sort of, you know, put back to bed. So I think that's also crucial as well as speeding up the process, making it simple, cutting the bureaucracy as far as possible and, and um, finding a, a proper set of, of guidelines, how one works to make it happen. So, Vimal, that's a question I put to you. I mean, you and I know scores of uh, African business people on the continent. The first question they're going to ask when we go back is, oh, that sounds great. When? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the time is now. I think the two things here, it's all welcome. The problem is that Africa is not waiting for somebody uh, called Europe to come and sort itself out. Uh, I think this is something that I would rather say it here. It's not going to wait. We have demand. We need to service it. It will be met by somebody from somewhere. If not Europe, it'll be China, it'll be India, it'll be Brazil, it'll be uh, you know America. So everybody's trying to get a piece of the action. The question is this analysis paralysis that we have a lot of times about, oh, we don't trust this, we don't trust that. It's changing. The time is now, and I think a lot of leadership, if you see leadership changes across, I mean, it's happened in the US, it's happened in the UK, Leadership changes are happening everywhere. In Africa, there's a leadership ethos right now that's saying, let's make a move, let's make it happen. Now, there is impatience there, and I think this is where we need to really say, fine, let's get on with it. However, partnering with them, partnering and making sure that we have thought leadership as, as far as it's concerned, also giving them direction. Dictating and saying, we're rich, you're poor, is going to be a thing of the past. Because we're saying, I look at you from a poor, a rich man's eyes, you're poor. I think aid is not important. It's not aid which gives us AIDS. By, by AIDS, I mean always in debt syndrome. And we're always becoming like a begging bowl. And I think that's what Africa must cease to be doing and saying, here's a begging bowl, give us some aid, give us some help here. I think it's better to say, here's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to do business. There's an opportunity to improve the lives of people. Come and make a difference. You really want to make a difference? Come out and make it. And I think we've got to remove this whole word called CSR, which is cosmetic social responsibility. We've got to make it more SRC, socially responsible corporates, social, socially responsible citizens, and countries. In that manner, the time right now is happening. There are 54 countries in Africa, and I think we've got to say this very clearly. And there are some that are leading, some that are laggards. And I think that's where a lot of us start branding Africa and saying, oh yeah, it's poor, it's finished, because one country, I mean, like Kenya is compared with Somalia, and that's always the case. And say, fine, it's, it's, not, it's not really going to happen. Same thing as Ivory Coast is being compared with, with other, other countries in West Africa. We've got to isolate countries and say, fine, which are the ones that are leading, which are the ones that are compliant, make them role models, make them examples of saying, here is what we did, we made a difference, the rest will follow. Can I just say as a fellow African resident here, here, before we carry on, but um, coming back to you, Mr. Gattaz, I mean, one of the, the key points of this whole thing is job creation, which... I mean, the country I live in is 25% unemployment alone. Uh, it's a key thing, but uh, a lot of uh, talk was yesterday about uh, sustainable jobs and how we must have jobs in the future. I can tell you, most of the politicians that I know in the continent will say we want numbers. We want thousands now. We want thousands for the, before the next election. How is business going to deal with that through this scheme? Well, I think, first of all, the business people um, well, Africa needs jobs and Africa needs SMEs. So we need to have our SMEs, European SMEs, go into Africa because most of the time it's large companies, big companies, Bolloré, Total, and so on. So we need to have the SMEs going there. To, go, to, to, to motivate the SMEs to go and, and, and create jobs, uh, first of all, from the European perspective, we need a trust environment. 
business-friendly environment. This is true for Europe. If you have the margin, you can go to Africa. If you don't have the margin, you don't go. You don't globalize, you don't export. You just you know, stay at home and wait. If the, we need a business environment which is, uh, which is good in Africa too. That means uh, no bureaucracy, uh, things uh, easy to deal with, and business people talking with business people. So I think it's very important to see that SMEs can talk with SMEs, local SMEs, and then they can partners, because, and, and they do business, and they do projects. Uh, then you have to, to, to guarantee the financing, because I think finance is a key stone too. There's trust, there's business-friendly environment in Europe and in Africa, and finance. Because sometimes you have billions of euros, you know, which are in the clouds. And in your, if you are a SME, you want to export, you want to do things, you don't see the billions. And so we need, absolutely, to make these billions going into the capillarity of the SMEs. Not staying you know, in the government, in the country, in the big infrastructures, but going into the capillarity of the SMEs. Because the SMEs will need guarantee of payments, they will need some security. So this is the most important thing, I think, to be sure that the SMEs from Europe will go and help creation of jobs locally. And then, of course, you have the education. Education is a keystone, too after the business-friendly environment, trust, uh, guarantee of finance, and so on. Education means you can create long-lasting jobs. And this is a part of responsibility. Between the, the, the companies themselves, we have to train their uh, colleagues and, and salaries and employees all over their life, because mutations are over there, digital is disrupting everything. So we need to teach to train our people all lifelong. And the countries, the governments must do that, too. So education is something that we have to build and uh, in a sustainable way in order to, to, to be sure that the companies which will create locally jobs uh, will, will, will be able to, to climb into the added value. Because what I look in, in, in Africa, they have quite it's, uh, um, amazing uh, raw materials and you know, uh, minerals, gold, everything. You have everything in the, in the ground, agriculture. But the prime is to create jobs, we need to increase in the added value. The jobs must go uh, in the, the upper side of, of the chain. So that's another uh, challenge to do, is to be sure that the people will not stay in the farms, in the, in, the, in the ground, but will become technicians, engineers, searchers. And in that case, you can develop sustainable companies, sustainable technologies, sustainable jobs locally. So Rebecca, if I could just ask you, I mean, at Forbes Africa, we believe the government coffers of Africa are empty. They're not going to create jobs for the youth that's coming up. From what you're seeing on the ground with entrepreneurs, how likely is it? Because often, as these SMMEs you're talking about, they can be the most vulnerable and the most prone to fail in the continent, it has to be said. How likely is it that they can create uh, the jobs that the continent needs? I'm, I come from an SME. I started, my, my, I started at a time when the word startup didn't exist and uh, I didn't get all the favorable conditions that you get as a startup. But ba basically, I think that is the backbone. But it's a question of, of creating a favorable environment. It's also a big question of education. That's also my background. My, where I work is in ed tech startups. And, and it's about the skills. So, um, and it's finding skilled people. I think a lot of people, a lot of um, the, the, the void in, in the labor market is not because there are no jobs. There are plenty of jobs, but there are a lot of unskilled people. And that's the crucial thing. So I, I personally think as long as um, banks are supportive as long as the government and the policymakers see the relevance of startups. But I could just jump in there. Yeah. I mean, I can give you a score of stories. Yeah. A lot of SMMEs, when they go to the banks, they get laughed at. Exactly, People yeah. say, I'm sorry, yes. we're not going to give you a penny. Yeah. We don't trust you. I mean, yeah. well, That's why I think education is hugely important on all levels, re-education on all levels, and understanding what makes growth. So I think it's really it's about um, the multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships and that all, all players in, in, in the arena understand how relevant it is to bring something forward. It's a change of mindset. But, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about Africa. Look at Europe. We have a huge problem with, with, with the same. And we have also a problem on the, in, in, the, in the sense of what are the future of jobs. That's changing very, very rapidly with the demographics. Uh, I think I'll probably have to work until I'm 90. And, um, and so I think uh, this, this, this uh, subject is relevant for every single continent, uh, and not just for Africa, but it's about re-changing re one's mindset and really having banks take more, uh, take more risks. Vimal is a highly experienced businessman operating in Africa. Where would you be directing the investment from outside to create jobs, sustainable jobs, that is? I think there's, there's many avenues right now. Every single challenge you name, and a lot of people talk about this challenge, there's a challenge, there's a challenge. Every single challenge in Africa is an opportunity for jobs. Absolutely there. 
If we have portals on the road, you can have road making machinery. You can actually do a lot more there in terms of everything. Telecoms, agribusiness, uh, we, we, we've been selling, sorry to say that we've been selling cotton to the world and saying, fine, make the shirts. Why don't we sell the shirts? Make the shirts, brand them, and then send them off overseas. We create a lot of jobs there. Um, talk about your, your co cocoa, right? We can make, convert it into chocolates and send it off across as Ladrach or even Lint or whatever and make it across. Get more jobs created out there. Coffee, the same thing. When we talk about that, there is tourism. There's immense amount of tourism possible out there. So jobs can be created. So if you've got funds and you say, fine, we want to direct this, uh, like you said, uh, Chris, I think a young entrepreneur going to a bank is asked for collateral. You got collateral, you got security, you got a house or something, we'll take it. We all, all the banks over there are doing asset backed financing. If you've got an asset, we're going to finance it. However, in the West here, you can get money based on a business plan to say, fine, here's a business plan, I'll give you working capital, and the money is flowing. The trust is important. I think this is where we got to re-look uh, re at what is the trust levels, number one. Number two, uh, in the banking world, the risk perception. All the people who map risk in Africa, they put it into a red color and say, this is hot risk, it is high risk. Very risky. I come from there, I'm born there, I'm brought up there, I'm going to die there. I think it's important to say we don't see risk from, the, from a local footing. However, the perception of a lot of Western banks is still it's too risky. Number one. Number two, um, collateral. Number three, um, working capital is not available freely. I think that Africa has got to get together with its bank, and I think the African Development Bank should also look at this and say, fine, create one different rule there for, for a lot of local young entrepreneurs to get financing based on you know, what you get out here on working capital. Number two, I think important thing is that um, a lot of the Western banks operate there. And they're all controlled now by OECD or by rules which are were applicable everywhere in the world. And I think Africans are not going to get any financing anymore. Our cost of financing goes up. We pay about 7 to 14 percent in dollar terms or euro terms in, in Africa to get borrowing in, 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 in foreign currency. Local currency is about 10 to 14 percent, to some places it's 20 percent per annum. Now, based on that, the expectations of everyone is, oh, if I'm paying 20 percent interest rate, my margin's got to be 30, 40 percent. So everything is going up in costs, including the cost of infrastructure, the cost of leasing. In fact, leasing is a big business out there which one could start doing. So there's a lot of capital equipment, and I think Europe makes a lot of capital equipment. If we start those leasing businesses out there, there'd be a lot of opportunities. So if you've got money and you want to invest it, I think a lot more equipment being available out there. If you go out here, there's logistics areas where you've got lots of trucks waiting to say, fine, you can hire me. In Africa, no, you've got to buy a truck, you've got to start doing all that stuff. So I think there's so many opportunities. I mean, I could keep on mm -hmm. naming them. Manufacturing, tourism, uh, agribusiness, um, even, even infrastructure. One thing I, I just need to raise with you, uh, Mr. Qatar, see what you think. I mean, one of the previous speakers said that there was this criteria of fragile states, so-called fragile states. It seems to me that could be a bit of a political minefield for this initiative because just the other week I was at the World Economic Forum in Durban, South Africa, with uh, President Robert Mugabe, and he was asked if he thought he lived in a fragile state, and he said, in fact, I don't. I think that if you want to call a fragile state anything, call the United States a fragile state. Um, I'm just wondering, politically, you're going to come and say, listen, you're a fragile state, we want to help you. You might get a very strange reaction from some of the politicians on the continent. Well, I think that, you know, if, uh, again, uh, every state can be fragile at a time. Uh, so the idea is, I, th I really strongly believe that economy is a rock. So if uh, you have a, a strong economy, which is with uh, SMEs, and you know, you, you can build a, a more, a more a less fragile state. Uh, so uh, because the economy is there, and when the politicians, you know, are moving from the extreme right to extreme left, the SMEs are here, the jobs are here, the economy is working. So this is why it's so important that to develop this economy and to develop these, these jobs, uh, because it's it's uh, it's the part of uh, reinforcing, uh, I think, the the, the 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 sustainability of the state itself. So economy is a key. And uh, just one more point that we talk, speak about SMEs. I would like to emphasize on entrepreneurship too. And in Medef, uh, French Business Association, we develop a lot uh, of uh, concrete actions again to develop entrepreneurships locally. I know that. Uh, there's a Tony Elumelu Foundations in Kenya, uh, in, uh, in Lagos, by the way. And uh, this, uh, um, uh, this person is uh, very brilliant to, to, to help 
local African entrepreneurs to develop their business. And I think this is another way to uh, recreate jobs, not only SMEs, not only large companies, uh, but also developing this entrepreneurship, helping the people to make the startups. And in Nairobi, 20th of November, uh, in six months, we are going to have the first startup meetings in Africa uh, with MEDEF and uh, an association that we created for that, in order that these guys can find advisors, finance, uh, friends, partners, to develop their own uh, business. And the more entrepreneur we'll have in Africa, the better it will be. So Rebecca, this idea of being an entrepreneur in Africa, I mean, I travel a lot on the continent and uh, I meet a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs coming up. I can tell you 99 out of 100 who make it, their parents have said to them, listen, why don't you get a proper job, be a teacher, why don't you go work for the government, get something that gives you a regular paycheck. How long do you think it's gonna take to change that mindset that being an entrepreneur, it's too risky and it's not like, in quotes, a proper job. Depends on the people, really. It depends, you know, I think a lot of people, ha ha either you're an entrepreneur or you're not. Often it's a, an early, early education thing. I, you know, people talk about teaching entrepreneurship at university. I think either you, you learn it early and it's, um, it, it's a character trait even. Um, you'll always have your parents arguing with you with what you want to do and you'll always have people trying to put things, making it difficult. It's going to be a slow process. Well, not necessarily. I think it's, it's you know, what, one thing about Africa, it's, 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 it, there's so much opportunity. There's so many ideas. I mean, if I were in my 20s and I was going to start a new business, I'd go there because there's so many things you can do. It's not saturated there. And it's just a question of, 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 of creati creativity. I think the most important thing really is, is teaching people and educating people from an early, early age to think differently, to have, especially in the soft skills area. So I think critical thinking is one thing, um, emotional intelligence, creativity, and, uh, and and also financial literacy is another thing, something I never learned at, at uh, you know, I think I'm learning it now. Um, but those things to understand um, and, to, and to take risks. And then the world's your oyster, really. Just before you come in, Vimal, you're, you're in Nairobi, one of the entrepreneurial capitals of Africa. Um, what are you seeing from the young people coming up? Uh, do you think that uh, this kind of uh, investment initiative is going to be fertile, do you think, amongst the youngsters you're seeing? I think uh, very, very clearly there's lots of youngsters and I, I'm, I'm patron of quite a few of these guys. One's called African Garage and they actually have uh, 25, under 25, under the age of 25 entrepreneurs who they give awards to every year. And you can see that entrepreneurship is, is a lot of it is inbuilt. However, what they lack is a bit of mentoring, a bit of road, uh, you know, sh show them how to, how, to, how to navigate and also some financial skills business plans. And I think if that education was imparted to them, straight away you could create all these guys into many, many, many more better things. However, linkage to market is another thing, right? And I think where they actually can produce products or produce the services, the linkage to market is where uh, the linkage is required. So big business needs to sort of say, okay, we will take this, the goods from them and, you know, contract them out. So there's a linkage there that could be provided and, and a lot more could be done. So when you talk about big business, when you talk about international business, there could be a lot more linkages being provided. However, government probably needs to do a policy change where say, oh, if you're actually supporting 20, 30, 40, 50 entrepreneurs, there could be some sort of incentive, tax incentive or whatever, that changes behavior. Because I think behavior only changes when there are incentives around it and or the disincentives around it. So there is possibility of this uh, you know, initiative becoming right. However, if it's not targeted properly, a lot of times, a lot of international organizations do G to G, you know, government to government or institution to government and expect the government to start sorting themselves out. Uh, I think it's the thing with sovereignty, right, that we will not interfere with your business. But I think private to private, a lot could be done. The private sector entrepreneurs can be promoted. Uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurship spirit uh, out there. In the value system, I think, in our countries. Uh, getting a government job is prestigious, it's high in the value system, even if the salary is low. It's more that, oh, he's now stable, and they don't like taking risks, because we're sort of risk averse. But where we come from, we don't see risk. And I think a lot of African young, young guys are really looking at founding companies. This has come back because of the internet. Now they look at the internet and look at what happened in Silicon Valley, what happened elsewhere, and they're actually talking about the Silicon Savannah out there in Kenya. So the Silicon Savannah will be like a Silicon Valley, now, what is Silicon Valley? It's a cluster of people with ideas, people with capital, people with, uh, you know, valuation expertise coming together. This is what we need to do out there. So if we can create a cluster out there whereby you've got capital coming there and saying, fine, come make your pitches, 
and then of course make them investable, and then have the round, for round one, round two, round three. Angel investing is non-existent out there. So the one that I saw in Silicon Valley was angel investing in venture capital. We need a lot more of that. But if I recall rightly, the Silicon Valley story you're talking about, Silicon Savannah in Kenya, there was a lot of government money put into training ahead of that. Do you think that this uh, kind of initiative can emulate that kind of uh, training and grassroots work? Yes, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, the new world that we are living in is full of mutations and digital revolution is a keystone. So it will revolutionize everything. And you can see the youth in all countries, this is true in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, in Africa, uh, want to become entrepreneur. And in France, for instance, uh, most of the young people wanted to be civil sur surgeons in the administration 20 years ago. Now 60% of them want to become entrepreneur, which is a big cultural move. And this is true in Africa, this is true everywhere in the world, because of revolution, digital economy, mobile. And when you look at the applications again on mobiles in Africa, it's absolutely outstanding. So it's new things, new you know, dreams that you can, new hopes that you can bring to the new generation, especially young people. And a good asset of Africa is half of the population uh, are below 25 years old. So you can see this energy, this enthusiasm, and uh, the idea is really to accompany them and to, to try to put clusters in place. That's for, absolutely for sure. We finance with some university, maybe education, and be sure that this guy can take a risk because it's a question of taking risk and then developing the project with the advisor, with the people who can help. And I think if we, if we are in this uh, dimension, uh, it should work, yes, in complementary with all what I said about SMEs and uh, what we all say about developing jobs. Rebecca, what's your view on this one? I, I agree. I think, um, I, just, I, the, I think the most crucial thing is really the, the aspect that Mr. Gata has already said is the education. Um, and, and, and that needs to be a very, very strong backbone uh, where different, the businesses need to be involved, where the government needs to be involved, and, and, and the policy makers in particular, and um, where um, a look at, f at future, uh, future jobs and the future needs, not the old, simulating old education models that we copy from, let's say, the West. Not everybody needs a university degree to have a lifelong job, but I think... Um, a lot of change is needed there in, 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 in that area to, to support um, a, a new, new, new um, potential and new, new creating of new organizations, but also existing organizations finding the skills they need and creating a stronger backbone. But Bimal, I put it to you as an African businessman on the ground. Uh, do you think we really need a, like a university of entrepreneurship and a professorship and a chair of entrepreneurship? I don't know. I mean, some of the best entrepreneurs I've met in Africa, some of them can't even read and write. Some of them um, have a very little education. Some of them don't even touch computers. You know, uh, some of the best guys that I've met. Do you think we really need a college for entrepreneurs in Africa? Um, I don't think we need a college of entrepreneurship. I think we need courses in entrepreneurship where it's required. I think it's business plans. Okay, let's look at it from a bank perspective. What does a bank look at when an entrepreneur goes there? They actually look for a business plan, they look for a, you know, where's your sales, where's your revenue, where's all that stuff. That skill, if we would teach them to say, fine, this is what a bank expects, this is what the, the insurers expect, this is what you should be doing, and then get all that de-risking model, uh, you know, taught to them, then they'll be formal. However, a lot of entrepreneurs, I mean, there's a traffic problem in Nairobi, I think everybody knows about that problem. And if you see the roads, there's many more entrepreneurs on the road selling you a lot of stuff. They'll sell you cold drinks, they'll sell you goods, they'll sell you, you know, stuff that you need. Were they taught that in school or university? No. It was all acquired on the job. And they're very creative in that sense. However, the skills that are required for becoming bigger and better, I think that's where we could actually have that course. And there's a lot of courses being taught in universities, technical schools already. But yes, we could actually start imparting that knowledge and say, fine. This is what a bank expects, this is what you start becoming. Financial, you know, like they say, you know, for, for people who don't know finance, teach them finance. Teach them all that sort of stuff and entrepreneurship is there. The spirit within is still there. So I think that's, that's there, it comes out. And again, I said yesterday, I think it's necessity is the mother of invention. So when you're pushed to it, um, you're really pushed to the wall, your salary is, is very small, you can't afford it, you're going to go and say, fine, now what do I buy and sell? I'm going to do an arbitrage between buying price and selling price and make some money in the middle. And that, that's happening. Services is now growing even faster than manufacturing. So there's a lot of services. There's home deliveries. There's so much more that's happening. And I think they're learning a lot on internet. A lot of people are acquiring the skills they find. How have people done it elsewhere? We can really straight away learn. So 
emulating that is important. However, it's not one university, one location. I think it's got to be across the board entrepreneurship. Even on YouTube, you know, the how to be entrepreneur, stuff like that, it's proliferating everywhere. If you go into any rally now today, you can see everybody with a smartphone taking videos or taking pictures of the, of the event, and everybody's doing that, even in rural, rural areas. So I think that when I look at that and say, where are they storing this? Where are they going to keep it? But the bandwidth is increasing. And therefore, there's a lot more learning that's happening. It's learning by doing, it's not just by university. A lot of good entrepreneurs don't even have degrees. <laughs> and they don't need a degree because they're not looking for jobs. And, and, and a lot of guys that I talk to in terms of university, because I'm also a chancellor of a university, <laughs> and when you go there, you actually tell them, if you got a degree, you are in the 1% bracket in Africa. Do not go and look for a job, go and create more jobs. <laughs> and that's what African graduates need to start doing, is, is, is create jobs out there in Africa. And I think if they start with one job, two jobs, the whole taxi service, I don't know if you know what uh, the taxi service in Kenya is, is amazing. It's competing with Uber. In fact, they've given Uber a run for their money. Uber had to drop their prices by 35% to compete with these guys. But if I could put that question to you, uh, Rebecca, as well. Um, I mean, isn't that one of the problems that the world has, not just Africa? I mean, one of our reporters the other day, he's gone off to go and from, he's from Zimbabwe, he's gone off to go and study classics in uh, Canada. And I said to him, what for? And he goes, no, I want to open my mind. I said, well, that's all very good. What are you going to do with it when you come back? And he didn't give me an answer. But isn't it that, that perhaps sometimes we're training a lot of people about uh, literature and history and all these lovely, wonderful things, which I enjoy, but is it not much help when it comes to creating entrepreneurs in no. Africa? No, it's great to have an open mind and to be an educated person. <laughs> it's wonderful because it means that you'll always want to read and you'll be able to make the connections and, and join the dots in, in all sorts of areas. But a classical education, I think, is a luxury. Not many people can afford that. Um, um, so, yes, new models need to be found. And I think university degrees, there's an inflation of people with university degrees who don't have jobs. Look at Germany, for example, where you have 50-year-old um, professors of biology driving a taxi. Um, you have great conversations with them in the taxi, but I don't think it helps them elsewhere. So I just think we need to look at, relook at that. And I think the, uh, the advantage also um, that was mentioned about online, learning things online, Google and YouTube are the biggest um, e-learning platforms that exist. You can find anything you want. You can learn to do anything through using YouTube. Um, the most important thing, I think, is most people, most young people everywhere in the world study for accreditation. They study for the degree. They don't study in order to learn something necessarily. It's a generalization, but they need that degree because that degree is the uh, opener when they have the job interview. And I think we need to change our mindset around that and really look at, A, what uh, Mr. Gataz mentions, the lifelong learning aspect. We'll all have to learn, have a lifelong learning scenarios because things change constantly, especially with AI um, and all sorts of other threats and, 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 and developments. So um, I, I, we need to look at that in a different way. But I also think entrepreneurs are people who are confident. I remember when I went to the bank uh, many years ago, they said that one of the reasons why they agreed to give me the loan was not, I didn't have a business plan, but they said it was personality. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, com it's confidence. But teaching people and teaching young people confidence as well, that's often, we're not, an, and, I, and I, I think I can say that in, in Africa, uh, different countries have different education models at home. Um, I used to, my, my education model in, in my generation was very authoritarian. It's changed completely in Germany. Your children, you know, constantly, they constantly criticize me, which I'd never dared to do with my parents. But I think the same as in Africa, we have a lot of respect for the elders. You have a lot of respect for your parents and you're often taught not to be confident. I think there's certain, I mean, I really think we need to focus on soft skills um, far more in, in, the, in educational institutions and also at home. A lot of that comes from home and who your parents make you to be. And may I, I don't know if it's closing soon, but women and girls is hugely important, especially women who have children and who educate their children. So well, that's one, one, key, one key focus. I children criticise their parents not in Africa woman. too, I can, I can promise you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, um, just um, one, we're coming to the end of this discussion now. One last question. I have to ask you, Ms. Gattaz, on behalf of European business, at the World Economic Forum, the uh, finance minister of Germany brought a plane load of top German CEOs to come and see what was happening on the continent. And we all wrote the story, including myself. And I thought about it afterwards. I thought, well, why isn't every single serious business European country sending people out all the time? There's so much going on. And I feel sometimes European business doesn't actually know what's going on on the ground uh, in the continent. Uh, what's your view on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. What I'm saying is, is that every country yeah. in Europe, in my view, should be sending people out and getting more information to about Africa, what's going Africa. on. Africa. Yes, to okay. Africa, yes. Okay. I think sometimes, I mean, for instance, uh, the billionaire Stephen Sudd, he built a um, pharmaceutical manufacturing plant there. 
No one knew about it. When the Americans came, they were shocked. They said, we can't believe the standards you have. We came expecting a game farm, yes. was his, his exact words. Mm. And we've got this world-class thing. I think sometimes there's a gap in knowledge about actually yeah. what's going on on the ground. Yes. How do you think Europe can close that? Yes, we, we, we should. Um, absolutely, you're absolutely right. What we do in MEDEF, yeah. uh, we have launched an association to create physical contacts, forums, mm. uh, as well as a digital platform in order for people to meet. So uh, which we have been doing that in Paris in December, in um, uh, Bamako in January. We are going to do that in Kenya in November. You know that people can meet. So I'm going to be with a delegation of SMEs uh, over there, 100. And progressively, I think Europe should do that. I mean, bring delegation of people, SMEs, business people, as well as politicians. But we need concrete actions again. And we need to feel what happens on the field. And in order to help. Uh, you're absolutely right. And again, I think that goes not only you know, by symposium or talks or anything, but going in the country, spending there, spending time, building projects are the keystones of the success for the future. So I think this is uh, the, the, the way uh, well, the business work and this is the way uh, the development should be done. Thank you very much, Mr. Gattaz. Now, we've just got about one minute left. I want to go along with all of you. Just a short statement, uh, just closing uh, for the, um, the audience here. Starting with you, Mr. B. Malshaw. I think, uh, first and foremost, Africa is an opportunity. Um, it is 54 countries. You've got to realize that, and you've got to look at where, where, where to go. But then there's Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and Central Africa, and five regions, five regional economic communities. Um, overall, I think um, when people in Europe look at Africa, they look at the GDP figures and say, fine, too small, too small, too small. I think the Belgian GDP is probably equal to the whole African continent. So when they look at those figures, they say insignificant. Therefore, when you talk about big corporates, they say, hang on, not, not significant at all. However, not significant at all today. Look at it from a long-term perspective. Look at it from 10, 20 years from today. And I think that's where the opportunity lies to say long-term. Number two is not having a short-term stint to say, I'm here for a, I'm a CEO for five years. I've got to look at this thing and say, fine, take, make some money in five years. It's not going to happen. I think it's going to be longer term. And that's where the Chinese are coming and saying, we want to be here for 20, 30 years, building railways, building a lot of stuff. Opportunity exists. I think it's all about who comes in and who takes it up. But Africa is open for business. I think governments are changing rapidly. And these changes are not reversible. Um, a lot of people try and favor it and say Zimbabwe or whatever. I think stop focusing on those simple countries because they have some leaders who, who will sell by dates over. So I think the question is, where is the next future, the next frontier? I think there's a big frontier coming. Uh, if you don't see the opportunity, you can actually stay in Europe. Rebecca. I'll make it shorter. <laughs> uh, Europe needs Africa. Our demographics, we need... We need to work together, we're neighboring continents and our demographics are not going in a great direction. We need, we need um, jobs, we need to fill jobs here as well. So I think there's only, the only path is together and it's a great continent to work with. It's a wonderful people, uh, it's a lot of fun and much more interesting than working with Africa than with Russia, for example, and uh, <laughs> Russians in the audience, but just in terms of, of, of ease and of um, respe common respect. Mr. Gattas. I would say that um, uh, Africa is the next big thing, and we absolutely need to have a big program for Europe, for Africa, uh, building it with a win-win balance partnerships. I insist on that uh, through business SMEs, for the young people, young Africans, because it's half of the population, through entrepreneurship too, uh, very important, and through uh, a kind of uh, uh, education. As we said, there's a tactical job with services. So we don't need too much education. You need the sales and so on. And you need, if you want to build planes in Africa within 30 years, you will need apprentices, you will need technicians, you will need engineers, and you need searchers. And I think this is the, the, the two things that we have to be developed is, of course, education, but low education for the people, you know, for tactical jobs, I would say, and uh, high education in any case, plus the fact that the digital revolution will, uh, will uh, uh, help to, uh, to create this new type of education on mobiles with the MOOCs and so on. So digital is a, a in very interesting uh, technology to help Africa to, uh, to develop. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierre Gattaz, the president of MEDEF, Rebecca Storoymeyer, the founder of eLearning Africa, and Mr. B. Malshaw, entrepreneur of Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you very much for lending your ears, and that's it. Thank you, sir.
That was Chris Bishop speaking to Pierre Gattaz, president of MEDEF, Rebecca Stromaya, owner and founder of eLearning Africa, and Vimal Shah, chairman Bitco Africa. After the break, we'll get some more views on this external investment plan. Welcome back to this special broadcast, still at the EU Africa Business Forum in Brussels. Jacqueline Mugo, Secretary of Business Africa, shared her views on the European Union's investment plan for Africa. Take a look. The external investment plan by the European Commission, which they announced yesterday, signifies a new thinking in the EU where they want to look at Africa as a partner they want to enhance the role of the private sector and they also realize that the traditional funding sources will not be adequate to finance the work going forward. So as a private sector representative, I think it's positive, but as they say, it's a plan. So the question is whether that plan will work. But what are you really expecting from, them, from the European Union now? I'm expecting the European Union to listen more to Africa and to consider the priorities that Africa has and finance those priorities and also to give uh, an opportunity to the private sector players on the African continent to make a contribution to projects that are viable that will help the private sector play the role that is expected of it in spurring economic development in the continent and addressing key issues such as the unemployment challenge that we have in a way that is win-win. Because up until now, in some areas we've tended to follow what the EU wants. They've not been so interested in what Africa's key priority and objectives are, but what the EU wants. So this should be a real partnership where both Africa and the EU come together to agree on viable projects that can be funded, which will actually address the key issues of poverty alleviation, and create infrastructure development, address sectors within our continent that can create jobs, and ultimately, as an African, I expect projects that are funded by the EU to raise the standard of living in the African continent, look at the traditional African entrepreneurs, not just big business, but sponsor the real economy within Africa, which is really the informal sector, and spur that informal sector to play a more effective, sustainable role in the development of the continent. One of the focus of this new investment guideline is to de-risk Africa. Do you think it's going to work? De-risking Africa should work because what the private sector and potential investors have been saying for some that it is very risky doing business in Africa. If you don't know Africa, the perception is that we are a very risky continent, which is not true because the risks in Africa are just as high as any other part of the world. But I think this initiative by the EU to create a fund that will cushion the African enterprises and private sector from what is perceived as too much risk should be able to help us generate more funding to finance projects and um, investments that will be able to address the key challenges that we're facing at the moment. So I am hopeful that this will be done in a transparent way that respects the views of Africans in deciding what should be funded. But I mean, at your level, you represent so many companies. Uh, do you have like um, a daily or, or at least a very constructive dialogue with the European Union? Yes, I, ha I and uh, many other Africans do have a constructive dialogue with the European Union. We have meetings um, every so often. I also serve on the ACP EU follow-up committee that for the last three or four years has really been tracking the, the progress made in the economic partnership agreements and playing back to the EU the challenges that 
employers and other stakeholders in the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries are having because the, EU, the EU was in some ways forcing their standards and requirements on economies that were not ready to sign the economic partnership agreements. So I'm hoping that the quality of dialogue under this uh, new funding structure proposed by the EU will be different and that they'll actually care what happens in a given economy after a particular agreement is signed. Chris Bishop also spoke with a man who wrote the external investment plan, none other than former EU ambassador to Uganda, Namibia and Malawi. Roberto Ridolfi, who sits as a Director for Sustainable Growth and Development at the European Commission. I think uh, this is um, the game in town. We had already a big, big presentation at the spring meetings in Washington. Now European Development Days is all about the investment plan. It's all about uh, triggering development into the mainstream of investments, private sector, big money to move uh, the socio-economic transformation that African leaders are pushing, you need the right investments to create jobs, to create jobs that are sustainable and decent. Sustainable because they can be sustained into a green perspective, SDGs, the environment, the social, and decent because without a growth which, inclu which is inclusive, uh, your society will not be fair, will not be stable, will be not peaceful. And that's where the investment plan of the European Union comes with three pillars. One is the investment, 44 billion is not enough, but is not uh, small. And the second pillar is, of course, a technical assistance to work both ways. One side to prepare the investment so, so that the feasibility study is ready for investors to plug in. And on the other side to do improvement in the business environment. Many countries have a red tape bureaucracy, legislations which is not conducive. I'm not talking only about foreign direct investments, I'm talking investment of the money that are in the country and money that are flying out of Africa. So the first objective is to keep money in Africa, invested in Africa for creation of jobs. And this for the first time as Europeans, I'm very proud to say, because I wrote the plan, we are very proud to say that this is in the interest of both people. It's not only a charity, it's not only a development action, it is an action in the common interest for prosperity and peace. And just break it down a little bit more how it's going to work. You said 44 billion euros. Yes. That's an investment fund or how is it going to work? It, it is going to work on the basis of a, a cash, which we call the European Fund for Sustainable Investment. Uh, sustainable development, sorry. This fund uh, will be having uh, two components. One is the traditional sovereign guaranteed big infrastructure projects. You need roads, you need railways, you need uh, transmission lines, you need uh, power plants, you need water. And the other one will be for private sector only. And that is on the tune of 1.5 billion, which will enable to guarantee investment up to 15, 20 billion. How? Very often the risk of an investor creating a factory in a certain place can be mitigated by us coming with a guarantee covering first losses. Up to 10, 20, 30 percent, it depends from the risk, it depends from the country. Because we want to move investments even in difficult countries, where today investments is not taking place. Too easy to talk about, for example, South Africa and Kenya, but it's very difficult to talk about other countries. And we want to have a big range of investments so that good ones can protect the risk that we take in bad or more risky situations. But we need to give hope to these countries in very, very risky situations. But surely, um, aren't people, the cynics, going to say, like, with these guarantees to make sure, aren't you just throwing taxpayers' money the way of uh, companies when they should be investing anyway? If the, if the environment was right in Africa, you wouldn't need guarantees. Correct. That's why the investment plan has got three pillars. The first is the finance, which operate at the same time. The second is the technical assistance. And the third is the business environment to make it right. So on one side, we look at the word additionality. Our intervention with a guarantee will only take place if that investment is additional to what would have taken place anyway. 
We don't want to just to throw money to what is happening. Mm -hmm. We want to put money where something is not happening and make it happen. And that is a very big difference. It's a difficult business. I am uh, flying over the difficulties of all this, eh? the big difficulties. But we will make it because there is no alternative in a way. Uh, how are you going to make this infrastructure happen? I mean, the World Bank has said in the past, very recently, they reckon there's something like 80, 90 billion dollars shortfall in infrastructure in the continent. How can you even hope to fill that up with what you're talking about? Well, we won't be alone. We will have, uh, as I say to you, it's very important that you note down the word hope. The word hope starts when uh, where there was nothing happening, something will start to happen. And that can be wonderful because it will free up a lot of energies, local energies, people, investors, local businesses that will then invest. We require infrastructure, we'll feed into the tax system. Domestic resource mobilizations goes along with that. We don't, we don't want to, this is, must be owned by the governments, this must be owned, every investment must be authorized by the relevant uh, ministers in the relevant countries. But yes, the challenges are huge, the money, as I said, is not going to be enough, altogether we shall make it. You talk about fragile states, investing in fragile yeah. states, a lot of, that could be a political minefield in the fact that a lot of countries in Africa may not see themselves in such a way and may make things difficult when you come in there. Correct. So let's not talk about fragile. Let's talk about investments today are not happening in that country. Okay. We want to promote this investment. We want to assist. We want to de-risk those that are willing to take uh, anyway the risk to go there. And so we look at the investment climate from that point of view. There is a lot to, to discuss about the rule of law, good governance and so forth. But when it comes also with an investment perspective, that could be much better than in isolation. The beauty of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis other partners is that we are not a bank. We are a political actor. We care about political relations. But in the political relation, in our global strategy, you will see that investments, the economy, the development are part of the toolbox of our relationship. So with the political relation, I was ambassador in uh, Africa, in Uganda, and our political relations was triggering development actions and reforms that otherwise are more difficult. As you can see, you need a little bit of optimism, given by the fact that we are mobilizing certain consolidated uh, mechanisms, acting with the right actors, not only three or four development banks, but many more commercial uh, banks and pension funds. As we speak, we are sitting on $8.3 trillion fetching negative interest rate. Is not an insult for you that this money is not invested in Africa? Mm, exactly, exactly. But I mean, don't get me wrong, Africa needs investments, like a man needs a drink in the desert. But what I'm saying is, is that aren't, isn't there a fear that Africans may see this as like dressing up of like aid or charity, that kind of thing, as investment? Uh, no. In fact, uh, the, the test is in fact that some, somebody may even see this as a reduction of official development aid. We hear in our conversation with the African leaders the word, we don't want charity, we don't want uh, development grants, we want investments. Do like China does. Well, China does what, what they do. The European Union, we want to do as big as they do, but in our, with our own values of principles of rule of law, human rights, democracy, environmental protection, social standards is a little bit more difficult, but it will be much more sustainable. How long did it take you to write this report? And, and how difficult was it? Do tell me. Uh, to write the, the plan the took plan. a weekend. Then uh, making it uh, uh, conversant uh, with uh, the big priorities took uh, very, very quick. Now, putting all the member states and the European Parliament together is taking a little bit longer, but we shall make by July. That was Roberto Ridolfi, Director for Sustainable Growth and Development at the European Commission. 
Thank you for joining us on this special broadcast. Remember that you can watch this and other content from EU Africa Business Forum on our website, cnbcafrica.com. Enjoy the rest of your day.